Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second day of the user meeting. Our first speaker is Tanya Horn. She will give us an overview of Mason form factors. Um, I'm not aware of any special announcements, so I think we should just go ahead and start. Uh, Tanya, go ahead. Great. Well, thank you, Will, and thank you for, uh, to the organizers for um, giving me the opportunity. Um, just to start, I wanted to uh, give you a very quick overview over um, the interest in meson form factors. So this is um, uh, a summary of uh, publications uh, that we had from our uh, Pion experience based on um, six GB, two six GB Pion experiments, we call them phase one, phase two. You see uh, this collaboration we started publishing in around uh, 2000. Um, and then we kept uh, publishing for, well, forever, basically, still up to now. And you see the number of citations are, are quite good for these for these papers. So there's clearly um, a lot of interest in, in meson form factors, in this case, in particular, in pion form factors, and derivatives. So there's various spin-off papers on LT separations um, and so on that uh, you might have seen uh, since about 2012 uh, up to now. All right, so then... Um, uh, telling a little bit about the renewed interest maybe in um, meson form factors and uh, meson physics in uh, particular. So if you first go to the uh, right hand side here, you see um, a scale and you've probably seen this before. That's essentially just telling that if you're looking at um, mass and in particular hadron mass, that uh, for the proton, the Higgs mechanism is just not uh, cutting it essentially. So that's just 1% of the proton mass. So really uh, what we need to consider is the dynamics of, of gluons. Um, that, that gives us well, basically the rest of the mass. Um, so that uh, this dynamics comes from uh, light quarks that acquire most of the mass uh, dynamically. So you see this here in the left hand uh, top figure is the mass function. The light quarks in, in blue, as you see here. Uh, the Higgs mechanism that dominates, of course, the, the uh, heavier quarks is on top. So there's basically no um, effect there. And then in the middle, in between the green uh, dashed line, that's a strange quark. So it's somewhere in between the um, dynamic uh, mass acquisition and the Higgs mechanism itself. So that's quite interesting to study any particles, of course, that have uh, a strange quark. Now, these mass functions you see uh, are supposed to be universal. So it might be a little bit surprising if you look then down here in this uh, box that lists the masses of proton, kaon, and pion, and uh, where the proton is about 1 GeV, uh, the kaon is about half of that, and the mass of the pion is about 100 MeV. Of course, it's a little bit uh, surprising that, that these masses would be so different if these mass functions, particularly for light quarks, are so universal. So understanding these um, light quarks, so the up and down quark, together with the strange quark and gluon, that really tells us um, um, a lot about the emerging, uh, emerging mass of the visible universe. Um, so, of course, uh, our interest would be then how do we um, connect, or how do we measure um, the origin of hadron mass, how do we understand that? And it turns out that meson form factors, pion and kern form factors in particular, are of special interest. Of course, we know them mostly as the clearest test case for just studying the transition between perturbative and non-perturbative regions. But then if you have a look at this uh, graph, uh, or these two graphs on the right, we see here again the mass function um, as a function of momentum. So again, remember, this is how the, um, well, the light quarks basically acquire mass. And then the calculations that are shown are using different strengths of uh, the emergent mass phenomenon. That's how um, essentially the measurement then would be connected through continuum or lattice calculation to uh, emergent hadron mass. In particular, it actually goes through a mechanism called dynamical chiral breaking. But for now, we just uh, consider here that there are two calculations where the um, solid green curve is about 20% larger in strength than the, than the dashed curve. So then if one calculates uh, from this the form factors, which is the lower bottom um, graph, one sees again the two curves. So the um, green curve is the one that's uh, with 20% larger um, strength of this emergent mass uh, mechanism and the dashed line about 20% less. And you see that clearly this normalization uh, of the form factor curve is uh, giving you a good um, measure of the size of emergent uh, hadron mass um, uh, mechanism. Basically, these, these form factors are a sensitive experimental probe to uh, measure the origin or the strength of emergent hadron mass. Um, just one more point, and also about the, um, um, the meson uh, distribution amplitudes. So these are shown on the top here. A typical feature uh, being um, uh, between x, of course, was 0 and 1. This ontotic one, we know it's kind of a peaked function around 0.5 or so. 
And um, if you include the, what I call the emergent hadron mass, so basically this phenomenon that uh, gives the uh, quarks uh, mass dynamically, then the feature we see is that these amplitudes uh, broaden. So this is the dashed uh, line here for the pion and for the kaon, the uh, solid line. Um, for the kaon, also one can note that the distribution amplitude is uh, not only broad, but also shifted with respect to 0.5. And that's again comes back to the fact that the kaon has one of these heavier uh, quarks and that is strange quark. If there, of course, were no difference between a pion and kaon, and if there's only a uh, dimersion hadron mass, well, these functions would look exactly the same. So interestingly enough, if you measure the differences between these two, uh, we could actually have uh, a measure of the um, uh, Higgs modulation on top of the um, emergent hadron mass uh, mechanism. Um, so there's recent progress, and um, I saw who when is talking later, so she might show this, this plot, in fact, because it's from her publication. Uh, here, this is just to say that continuum results calculations exist of this, um, and the lattice QCD uh, calculations are arriving, and here's just a summary of these calculations and lattice calculations, and uh, probably we'll hear about them uh, in a few talks from now. So instead, I'm going to move on to the experiment. Uh, so here, this is a summary um, of meson form factor uh, data that have been taken over the years. So, I mean, this is not something that's that's new. It has been starting, uh, well, in well, many years ago, 1959 is the first time it shows up in theory, and then there were many experiments uh, since then, from um, Cornell to um, uh, Fermilab, Daisy, um, and so on, and also JLab 6GB, which I already, of course, mentioned. Uh, now, more recently, um, uh, there has been a renewed interest and major progress on the theory side, and then with experiment now at 12GB, we have the capability to go to the large uh, Q-squared range and look um, at many of these uh, rather interesting um, phenomena. Then, of course, beyond that is the ESC, and I will say a few uh, words at the very end of this talk. Uh, just as a very brief review how we actually measure this, this form factor, we use a process called the Solomon process. Um, it's essentially um, saying that we, we scatter from uh, a virtual pion cloud of the proton that's illustrated on this uh, top uh, picture here. So the central dot would be the proton. Uh, you scatter off it, so you um, uh, kick out a, a pi plus or a pion that you actually measure, and the neutron is the recoiling particle. Um, so this is also, of course, illustrated in this in this diagram below. Um, now, but what you need to to measure the form factor is the uh, longitudinal cross section. Well, that's what we measure, obviously. Um, and uh, to access the form factor, well, you can see it here in this very uh, uh, simplified uh, uh, equation. Uh, so you measure the the um, uh, cross section on the uh, left, and particularly the longitudinal cross section because that's the one that is uh, dominated by the pion pole. Um, shown on the right, and then you have in here the um, uh, coupling constant, Q squared, of course, and the form factor itself. So it looks uh, simple, but of course, in practice, we use a much more sophisticated model. And then there are certain requirements that have to be fulfilled in order to actually well, make this measurement. One of them is that you need to make a full LT separation of the cross-section, uh, and that's to isolate the longitudinal cross-section as shown in the equation. You need to select the pi pole process um, from other uh, background processes. Um, and then, of course, as I already mentioned, there has to be a model to extract this form factor. And um, since we're using a model, we also have to validate the technique and so basically perform various model-dependent checks. Uh, just a brief example, our review of DLT separation, how this works. So you take uh, data, um, as shown in this um, plot on the right. So this is the cross-section as a function of the azimuth angle. You measure it um, at two different um, beam energies, and all of this is done at a fixed at Q squared, W, and, and T. Um, and then the Rosenbluth separation essentially says that you uh, simultaneously fit these data as a function of the angle and then extract the uh, various uh, terms, uh, which are essentially the cross-section, according to this formula down here. So we get a longitudinal term, a transverse term, two interference terms. And then the one that we want, of course, for F pi is, is this first one in, in red, uh, sigma L, the longitudinal cross-section that gives us uh, the pine form factor. Um, now, this is all um, looks simple, um, and of course it's not, and that's just because of this little uh, epsilon here which is on the order of something like 0.3 or so in JLF kinematics. Um, and of course, it comes in as one over epsilon, so, so any uncertainty is amplified by such uh, a factor um, in the systematic uncertainties of the uh, form factor or the cross-section itself. So what you really need to control is spectrometer acceptance, kinematics, and efficiencies, and so on. Um, and so that's uh, essentially why um, magnetic spectrometers are a must for such uh, precision cross-section measurements as needed for the pion form factor. And as it turns out, this is something that can be done 
uh, very well in Halsey uh, where the SHMS, uh, the super um, uh, high momentum spectrometer was built to meet these uh, requirements. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about the experimental validation um, and the model and uh, if one actually measures the physical form factor because as you of course um, notice is the Solomon process is not a real pion target but a virtual pion target. So uh, we have done experimentally um, over the last decades uh, a lot of studies essentially to give us confidence um, in these, this method that we're using to yield the, the physical form factor. So one test one can do is to take data over a range of, of T and then compare with the theoretical expectation and just in a, in a nutshell just means you measure the form factor for a range of T and see if it changes from small to, to large T. As you can see here on the right hand figure on the top uh, panel, uh, the form factor as a function of T is, is quite constant so that gives us confidence in the applicability of the model that we're using in, partic in, in, this, kinematic, in this particular kinematic regime of the data. Uh, another thing one can do, um, as I mentioned, that the pion pole oscillation is important, so we can verify that this is the dominant contribution uh, by measuring the uh, ratio of the longitudinal cross section for pi plus and pi minus production. Um, that essentially should be equal to, to one. That's an argument on uh, priority, um, G priority conservation. Um, and again, you can see that uh, this is uh, this results are quite constant as a function of, of t. And again, both of these results then give us uh, quite some confidence that the method we're using is valid and we can use it to extract the uh, physical pine form factor. Okay, so now if the method is established and uh, is so on for the measurement and we can go here to 12 GV and um, I can tell you about uh, a few of the uh, experiments that um, are going on in uh, Hall C. Um, first, uh, here's just a, an overview, a brief overview of the experimental equipment. We use the uh, super high momentum spectrometer as I mentioned already, important for the um, uh, precision measurements and the high momentum spectrometer as, as well. Uh, in particular, the pion experiment LT separation uh, requirements um, influence the design, in fact, of this uh, super high momentum spectrometer, including the small forward angle capabilities, the angular reproducibility, and also uh, missing mass resolution. And in addition to that, uh, the proponents of uh, these experiments, in fact, both pion and, and Kaon, uh, build and are maintaining um, some of the key detectors of this spectrometer that includes the uh, aerogel Cherenkov detector and the heavy gas Cherenkov detector. Uh, that was uh, built and uh, is partially funded by University of Regina. So coming to the experiments, um, so first I'll talk about the Pion um, LT experiment. Um, so you see here the uh, spokespeople, uh, graduate students. Uh, the goals are uh, two. So one is um, for one to measure the separated cross sections. So that includes a full separation of longitudinal transverse interference terms uh, as a function of X. Um, uh, this one allows to investigate the reaction mechanism towards 3D imaging studies. So that's not exactly the, this, the topic of this talk, but it's something that uh, can be done, of course. Um, and then uh, also the reliable pion form factor extraction up to the largest Q squared. For pion LT, this is the largest Q squared ac accessible at JLab until the ESC. So both of this together gives us a comprehensive and coherent program of charged pion electric production and uh, using this power of LT separated cross sections. Uh, the motivations, of course, are already listed. Uh, I mentioned that um, one uh, needs to validate the heart exclusive reaction mechanism. The key here is uh, the longitudinal transfer separated cross sections, uh, that, which are the clearest test case for the studies from non perturbative uh, to perturbative um, uh, regions uh, beyond DVCS, of course, um, and then could allow to access uh, the GPDs. Uh, just a little bit more on this, uh, I would call it here the reaction mechanism studies. So the way to, to test the reaction mechanism is uh, done through the Q squared dependence of the electroproduction cross section. Again, it's important to separate longitudinal transverse terms. And that is because uh, if uh, one is in the scaling regime, then uh, sigma L scales uh, to leading order at least as Q to the minus six, while sigma T, the transverse uh, contribution does not. Um, so, of course, then this uh, validation of the re uh, reaction mechanism is essential to interpret uh, the data from the GPD program. And in particular, it goes like, like this. If sigma t is confirmed to be large, then one could investigate transversity GPDs. If sigma l is measured to be large and it follows this, these trends as shown in these two uh, curves here, um, then, uh, then one could probe the um, usual GPDs. And again, just to give the range, uh, uh, pi plus production will be measured up to about uh, 9 GV squared and DKM production up to about 6 GV squared. So it gives a good lever arm on um, these two measurements and should give a good um, a test, a stringent test of the reaction mechanism for these two channels. 
Come to the form factors. Um, here I already mentioned that uh, in HOSI we completed a series of um, uh, pi measurements. Um, these are among the top sided rocks from JLab and uh, show that uh, we can do reliable uh, extractions. Uh, new higher Q square data um, shown in this uh, plot on the bottom uh, right, uh, essentially here these um, uh, diamonds in blue. Um, would challenge the, the uh, QCD-based models. All of them are shown here. There's various ones that are listed down here um, in a, in a um, very rigorous way and, uh, of course, provide us a real advance in understanding light quark systems uh, connecting to what I talked about earlier about the light hadron masses. So again, these uh, blue uh, uh, diamonds are the one, uh, the data that will be taken, uh, including also here this uh, red uh, diamond. And it says here the difference is that in this case, we're assuming that, of course, we have pi pole contributions it's a point that needs a little bit more checking than the other points, just because we're going so far out in the Q-squared reach. Um, so we have actually taken already some data for Pion uh, LT for this experiment last summer. Um, so in this case, we were able to complete uh, true LT separation, just again to briefly review how it's done. So we take data at three SHMS angles to get this azimuthal uh, coverage that I talked about earlier to do LT separations illustrated here. So on the one side, we call it maybe uh, right uh, cent center setting and uh, left settings. On the SHMS, then we also, of course, need, as I mentioned, uh, different beam energies, two or three. And that gives us then in this table um, one point uh, Q squared each. So we were able to take um, two full LT separations, these two um, points here on the top for the form factor measurements, and then um, two more points uh, for the reaction mechanism, where we couldn't uh, take both uh, points, two, uh, not both energies, but only one. Um, but of course, it's already uh, great progress either way. Uh, for the form factors, um, here on the right uh, plot, you see the points that we acquired in the uh, summer last year uh, with the projected uncertainties. These are not the data yet. This is just giving you an idea of, of how well we think we can, um, we can do with the extractions. All right, and here's the outlook. So as I mentioned, we have taken the low Q squared data in summer 19. This was about the equivalent of three PSC days. Um, these data should, uh, once we take, well, all of them, should enable us to take, um, uh, to, to present measurements of the separated pi plus cross section of function of X, uh, sorry, Q squared at uh, three values of, of X. That's also illustrated in this, in this table on the right. This one just gives an overview of uh, the data that have been taken by check mark data that remain to be taken at the moment by a cross, but um, of course, as, as you know, there's a, a schedule coming out, and so the, some of these non-standard energies that go with these points um, are uh, essentially on the schedule, and that goes then with some of the uh, points, again, as shown um, uh, in this plot. There's also two points um, that are now new that were not in the previous plot, is from uh, another experiment that I'm going to talk about next. It's actually dedicated to chaos. But of course, in the acceptance, we had some pions, so we can perhaps here take some additional extractions of the pion form factor uh, shown by the red uh, diamonds in the plot down here. Uh, and overall, just to say again, we can reach the kinematic reach goes all the way out to about eight and a half, uh, nine GB squared. All right, so switching to uh, chaos now, as I uh, already mentioned. So this is the experiment um, uh, here. Spokespersons are listed. It's a similar goal, separated cross sections is. Um, the um, I guess the name of the game in some sense. Um, that's that's the that's the power of these these measurements, and then also uh, studies of the reaction mechanism. In this case, uh, the um, uh, Keon uh, pole studies are basically studying the uh, cross section as a function of t uh, to see if we can extract the um, uh, Keon form factor. It's a little bit more complicated because the Keon is is heavier than the uh, pion, so further away from the pole. So these are the first data, um, uh, cross-section data for Q-squared scaling tests with kaons, also the highest Q-squared for LT-separated kaon electroproduction cross-sections uh, above the resonance region. Uh, here in this uh, right-hand plot, then you see uh, the possible extractions of the kaon form factor. So again, this reaches out to about uh, Q-squared of, of six or so. Uh, the uncertainties projected, as you, you see here, are actually already um, the ones that go with the data that we have taken and I'll show all of uh, the data. Um, collected in a, in a table in a few slides from now. But this just gives you an overview of what's uh, possible um, from this experiment. Um, here, just a few points about the Kion uh, and Pion setup. So you see the setup in Hall C with a target, of course, in the center, and then two, two arms, two precision spectrometers, magnetic spectrometers uh, on the right, the SHMS and the HMS on the, on the left, and a beam line here in the, the center. So it's pretty much the same setup for both experiments. Um, for detection, uh, the SHMS is used for the for the hadrons, so the pion or the kaon. Uh, the angles are usually uh, varying, but but 
rather forward. So here for the Kion, you see six uh, degrees, for instance. Momenta, okay, go go quite quite high as well. And then for the uh, HMS, this is uh, the scattered electron. It, the angles are a little bit more relaxed. But the point to see is just that if you if you look at these two angles, six degrees and uh, eleven degrees, smallest angles. If you happen to take data at those, there's pretty much not much separation between the spectrometers in this top photograph that you see here. So they're basically touching each other already. So it's quite scary to to see that in the hall. Um, so particle identification, I already went over that. Um, the uh, CUA, we built the aerogel detector for, in particular, for the kaon proton separation for this experiment, and then University of Regina built uh, the heavy gas drink off. Um, the uh, aerogel was actually supported by an NSF MRI, as uh, shown here, so we'd like to acknowledge that, of course. Uh, it's been uh, installed since 2015, and since uh, 18, 2018, we made uh, quite a few um, tray exchanges uh, it's it's uh, something that's not uh, not trivial. It uh, requires quite a bit of work, as as people from, uh, of course, Halsey and Associated uh, know. Um, the detector here with one tray installed is is shown here. The performance on the in these two two figures uh, in the in the middle, so it performs as expected for all refractive indices. Quite stable. That's shown in the bottom plots down here. And if you want to know more, you can read in this uh, publication in in MA that we made in, in 17. Um, and then here is just a note that says that uh, some of the trays uh, need some uh, additional refurbishing before we use them again, uh, and that's just because um, they never used uh, well, basically wear and tear. All right, so this is the, the slide I, I said where I would summarize the data in the table. So here they are. We completed all data taken in spring 2019. Um, the table lists uh, all the Q-squared points. Again, this includes, of course, all different angles, all different energies, and so on and so on. But we took the, uh, enough data to complete LT separation, so all of this is under analysis right now, uh, to give just a brief idea of the uh, quality of the data. That's the top plot. So you see here the K lambda, that was the channel, main channel of interest. But then we had also additional resonances that we can um, study and uh, we'll get additional physics um, well, for free in some sense. So the analysis, in fact, that include uh, not only the Kion channel, which of course is listed here, LT separations, uh, the um, uh, Q, uh, Q dependence, uh, um, coupling constants, and then of course cross sections for these additional lambda channels. Uh, but we also have data in the pi plus channels. We can do similar things there. And then even more interesting, we have also some data in the proton channel. So it's so a lot of physics uh, coming up from this experiment. And uh, I guess I can only say stay, stay tuned for for interesting results. Um, so in terms of the status, uh, of course, the analysis is ongoing. Um, calibrations, we are um, mainly done with the detectors. Here's uh, um, just some on the, the right-hand side, some highlights of, of analysis. Uh, reference times is completed. The heavy gas to Rankov, we had some interesting challenges. So um, you see here two compar a comparison of two, um, let's say, time uh, periods, so fall and spring. Uh, the, the picture should look like the one on the right, so kind of like an hourglass shape. Uh, there were some some troubles with mirror alignments in the fall, so you see something that's not so great, the hole in the middle. Um, that was looked a little bit better than in the spring, and of course there's some interesting challenges uh, associated in the analysis that um, we are uh, dealing with right now. Um, but okay, we're in the in the uh, phase of efficiencies, dead times, kinematic offsets, and um, are working our way through. And then you see the additional steps, uh, first iterations of cross sections, hopefully soon, and then uh, fine tuning and so on and so on. So analysis ongoing, and again, please stay tuned. Uh, and just to finish here, I wanted to say, as I promised, uh, a few words about um, future outlook uh, of meson uh, structure function and form factor studies um, at the Electron Ion Collider. So we have a meson structure function working group, uh, and the members are, are listed here. Um, these are researchers from basically all over the world, including people from Europe, uh, Asia, um, South America, where I see uh, where. I cannot quite find them right now, um, but basically from anywhere, everywhere in in the world, um, the uh, have backgrounds from experiment, phenomenology, theory, lattice QCD, uh, and so on. And together we work on the development of the science projections and detector requirements for such, such uh, structure function studies at the ESC. Uh, recently we had a workshop and that showed again the, the interest in this topic. Um, so the title is listed here. It was simply called a workshop on pion and kaon structure functions at the ESC. It was held or was to be held at the center of uh, frontiers in uh, nuclear science at uh, Stony Brook University. Of course, with the recent um, uh, health uh, crisis, this was held online, but still we had, as you see, quite a lot of interest, quite a lot of participants. And if you're interested, of course, you're welcome to, to study this working group. You can email me or email one of the conveners of um, this listed on the ESCUG webpage. 
And then here's just an outlook or a kind of an overview of what one can do in terms of form factors at the EIC. So uh, what's shown here in this uh, plot is, uh, well, first of all, the existing data uh, up to about two and a half GV squared and Q squared. Then what I just uh, talked to you about, the 12 GV um, measurements that are ongoing right now in gold and in green. And then on top of that, the projections for the kinematic reach uh, at the ESC shown in these um, the stars, the black stars, and the projected uncertainties. So it's, it's quite a nice uh, kinematic uh, reach out to Q squared of about 35, so that should, should really be able to discriminate between these different models and also, as I said, connect back nicely to understanding the uh, light hadron masses. One thing I should mention is uh, that in this uh, case for the ESC, and this is summarized here on the on the right, one um, cannot really use these, uh, this, this power of the LT separation in, um, uh, in, in, in the uh, analysis, and, and that's just because of the, the way these uh, collider works versus fixed target experiments doesn't really have this, this um, uh, power of, of um, uh, separation. But um, since it is such, uh, it's such high Q squared, one can actually assume that uh, sigma L, the longitudinal cross section, dominates. But of course, one has to verify that. And one, there one can use a similar technique as before and measure this ratio of uh, pi plus to pi minus production. Um, and that's uh, shown here in the bullet uh, five, where one measures this, this ratio compares to a model and confirms and validates this, this uh, reaction mechanism essentially. So for pi on, it looks pretty good. And again, if you would like to see more, you can read in this publication from last year, where we discuss um, the meson form factor measurements and potential at the ERC. Um, and then, of course, the question remaining is, uh, can we do the same for the K-on? Uh, that's something that's under study um, by uh, this, this uh, meson um, structure function working group. Okay, just then to summarize, uh, I uh, discussed here uh, the meson form factor measurements. Um, they have been um, of great interest uh, recently. I've shown this in terms of many publications over the years. Uh, there's renewed interest in terms of um, the um, understanding of um, light hadron masses um, and um, uh, basically the uh, basics of, uh, in terms of the basic principles of QCD. Uh, there's been much progress in uh, theories on continuum and lattice cal uh, QCD calculations. And then of course, right now ongoing uh, uh, measurements at, at 12 GVJ lab, which already uh, quite dramatically improve the um, data sets for pion and uh, k on electric production. Um, so I uh, mentioned, of course, the extraction are possible for pions and k up to nine and about six GeV squared. Uh, the k experiment is completed and under analysis. The pion experiment uh, took some low Q squared data last summer and um, is on the schedule for taking more um, next year. Um, and then beyond uh, all of this at uh, our JLab 12 GeV, the ESC will provide additional interesting opportunities uh, to map uh, pion kern structure functions and, of course, the meson form factors for uh, quite large X and uh, Q squared landscape. Thank you. And I would also here, of course, uh, like to acknowledge my support uh, through the NSF grants uh, listed down here. So thank you very much again, and uh, I take any questions. So we have three questions listed. Thank you for staying within your time. We have about one minute on the schedule or two. The first one from 912 from Victor Mokayev is, why for the pi n form factor, you need only the longitudinal part of the pi n cross section. The T channel diagram also contributes to the n pi channel with transverse polarized virtual photons. Yes, okay. <laughs> so um, we go back <clears throat> to the simplest way maybe to look at it is, is just this. So the form factor is directly related to the longitudinal cross-section, transverse cross-section, the one would actually consider the uh, a background. Okay. And uh, the next question from 919 from Nilanga is, thanks for the nice talk. Can you pre briefly go over studies of pion structure functions at JLab 12 GEV and EIC also? <laughs> I would, I would like to. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. So, so well, I, I would, I would, yeah, I would have liked to to do that, uh, Nilanga. But I just uh, this one, I focus only on the meson form factor. But um, but this is is, is definitely it's, it's a subject of this this uh, in part this this working group. And of course, I know there's um, uh, as you know there's an experiment <laughs> ongoing <laughs> for the tag DIS. So there's many um, proponents of that experiment also part of this structure function uh, working group. So so I, I did not in this talk I did not have time to discuss in detail about the uh, tag DIS experiments, but um, they, they are uh, very relevant for um, studying 
uh, of course, uh, the um, in particular, the, um, the the meson structure at uh, larger x and resolve perhaps some issues uh, related to resummation and and uh, various other uh, puzzles that have been um, uh, of, of, of of great interest <laughs> in in this uh, subject area. But unfortunately, I, I could not cover this in this talk. Okay, Adam asks uh, to be confident in pi and pole dominance. T should be of the order of negative m pi squared, which is around 0 0.02 GeV squared, which is much smaller than what you have shown, which is for T similar to 0.2 and larger. Uh, absorption, sorry, absorption and other exchanges are relevant for T or of a 0.2 or so. Can you reach the relevant T region? So yeah, so but this this uh, T region is yes, it's it's a T region that's uh, based on a calculation. Um, there's uh, other recent calculation that um, present a T range that um, valid T range for um, the region where a virtual pion can be considered a real pion that goes up to 0.6 or minus 0.6 if you like GV squared. Um, experimentally, of course, we can do something very different. So you see here um, our studies. Um, experimentally, we can show that we are in a T range where um, we can confidently extract a form factor. So here, in this case, up to about 0.4. I mean, this is just where the data end. So what we would do, of course, for the um, new data, if they had hard larger T, we would do the same study and then convince ourselves that the method is applicable before we would post or rather publish a result for a form factor. So we would take the experimental approach. There, of course, in parallel, there are calculations ongoing that tell us um, about the region of confidence where we should be able to extract this, uh, this, this, this form factor that is observable uh, or the extracted quantity. And so we hope then uh, that there will be additional calculations that, that guide us um, uh, along the way as, as well. Okay, uh, Bill Lee says, great talk. Could Tanja comment a little more on why LT separation is a challenge at EIC? <laughs> Yeah, so that one, uh, the issue is uh, related to the um, the energy separation. So um, you remember, it, we need in principle take two uh, beam energies to make an LT separation. It's not just the azimuthal dependence, but also the, the beam energy separation given by the, the epsilon. Uh, for the ESC, um, it turns out that uh, because of the energy combinations accessible, in particular because the proton or the ion energies are rather large, is that uh, the epsilon separation is essentially zero. And so you cannot do the traditional LT separation at, at an ESC. Um, however, as I mentioned on this, uh, or summarized on this slide, uh, we have found uh, a method um, that we can use uh, to, to still go ahead and uh, extract the, the form factor using a slightly modified uh, technique, essentially. Okay, and finally, Sebastian Kuhn asks, why would one expect pi plus divided by pi minus to be equal to one in deuterium? After all, the main binding is due to pi plus and pi zero exchange. Right, okay, so this is, uh, okay, we can, uh, the way it's listed is simplistic, of course, here. One could list it in terms of the um, the amplitudes, and then you would see that um, it's, it's, a, it's a simple argument based on isoscale and isovector. Uh, contributions. Um, so if you have, um, basically the process is isovector, so if you have isoscalar contributions to the process, uh, and here again, it's, I'm sorry, it's, it's listed just as a simplistic ratio, not in terms of the amplitudes, um, you would see that this ratio uh, in, in the presence of isoscalar contributions would deviate um, from, from one just because, well, the process should be essentially the same, so the isovector should be um, one on one, so it's, the ratio should simply be one. This case, so um, so that's maybe the simplest way. But but yeah, I mean, if if you wanted to to know the details, I, I would have to show you here in terms of the um, the amplitude ratios, which I'm happy to do offline. Okay, thank you very much. We're a little over time now, so we will go to the next speaker. Thank you again, Tanya, for the talk. Nice talk. And so that's BitLab. Maybe you can stop sharing. I uh, am sharing. Yeah, stop sharing. Yeah, thank you. Now. If DeepLab can start sharing. And also unmute in case you are muted. Can you hear me now? Not very well. Can you hear me?
close to the microphone or something different. Okay, can you hear me now and see the screen? You can see the screen, we can hear you, but the more you can do to make it louder and sharper would be helpful. But go ahead and start. Okay. Let me... Okay, very good. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, thank you for this uh, for this invitation, and it's a pleasure to to talk again in front of uh, the GLAMP community. Uh, for people who do not know, I was actually a PhD student working on the class experiment. So today I'll be talking about uh, heavy flavored exotic hadron from uh, from E. So uh, first of all, as an introduction, uh, exotics in the light quark sector. Uh, so exotics, as uh, everybody knows, are basically anything beyond conventional mesons and baryons with the uh, hybrid global tetraquark or pentaquark. Uh, now, in the light quark sector, I, you know, there have been long been this surmise that uh, the F0500 or 980s are high pi or KK tetraquarks or, or molecules, but typically they have been difficult to establish from PWAs. Uh, for the baryons, uh, <clears throat> Of course, you had the 1450 uh, beta quark, which sort of went away. So historically, it's been hard of sorts to establish uh, these things in the light quark sector, a uh, UDS sector. And I, this is a snapshot from the latest PDG, which says that, you know, uh, when the LHCB beta quark came out in 2015, there was this uh, uh, prevailing mood that these things do not typically exist. So, okay, <clears throat> so uh, one thing, uh, just as a passing, uh, the, uh, so what about the strange quark? The strange quark is not really that light, so it behaves uh, something in the middle. Uh, now from class, uh, we published these detailed uh, data from, from, from near threshold till around 2.8 jet. And uh, the main feature, or one of the interesting features of the data was this local uh, bump around 2.1 jet in the 5p invariant mass, uh, which could be a pentaquark in 5p. Uh, but the problem was that this thing appeared only in the forward angles, then then went away in when you looked at uh, larger angles. So, uh, so it's most probably a rescattering effect. But you know there there are models which predict that resonances resonances can be produced at kinematic endpoints. <clears throat> so okay. So moving on to heavy quarks, and the start of course was this famous uh, November Revolution, uh, which 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 happened in 1974. Uh, by the discovery of the heavy charm, uh, the GSI at both at SLAC and BNL, uh, and this this thing was a narrow peak in uh, GSI to E plus E minus, and this is on the light on the left hand side. You see, actually see a plot of 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 the psi Greek psi sim, symbol being produced by uh, psi two S D king to GSI uh, pi pi. Now, so uh, so. So, so, so some some things happen. Uh, actually, a lot of things happen once you go from the light light sector to the heavy sector. So uh, the charm mass is 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 very heavy to, compared to lambda QCD, which does a lot of things. Uh, for example, what this means that alpha s computed at at mc square is now uh, quite small. It's 0 0.03 instead of, of the order of one for the light quarks. So this allows the charm to essentially climb out of the so-called QCD brown muck. And uh, and allows for very simple non-relativistic uh, calculations like what we do in, in graduate courses. And uh, along that line, for example, this so-called Cornell potential, uh, where you have a Coulomb-like term and then a confinement term, were actually quite 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 successful in in, in predicting the the observed CC bar and BB bar uh, spectrum and their branching fractions as well. So uh, so a lot of things went right uh, with these non-relativistic models. Okay, so uh, so I think the first problem of sorts uh, started appearing uh, in, in 2003 by the Bell uh, discovery of the 3872, which is also now called Chi C1 3872, and this was sort of an accidental discovery because Bell is a B factory; it was not measured. Uh, I mean, it was it was meant to do CP violation and so on, but Bell discovered this thing in B plus to GSI pi pi K plus X is unknown, so they were not sure what this is. It's it's uh, so this thing is very narrow, okay, and it doesn't fall within uh, you know it's quite far away from any known uh, or, or or any predicted CC bar candidate, so it's not a charm on it. And then uh, we know that now we know that GPC is one plus plus, and this was actually measured in, in 
B in 2014. And the other uh, other very uh, interesting thing is that this this guy is right at the DD star threshold, basically bang on. Okay. And uh, so funnily, uh, you know, Bell is uh, again <laughs> CP violation, so on P physics. But this thing is 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 actually the most cited Bell paper. Uh, Kais, uh, Kais, uh, sorry, X3872. Uh, so, and again, uh, this, this, after this, the Bell discovery, this has been seen in many other experiments, production modes, etc. And I don't have time to go over this, but LHCB has just recently published two, uh, uh, two papers on, uh, on a very detailed uh, line shape study of, of the X3872. So, uh, the, this, this thing remains still, remains the first concrete proof of non QQ bar states appearing. So uh, now around 2003, if people remember this was the same year as uh, as uh, the Pentaquark from Let's came out, and so this was a very hot topic, and uh, you know, many novel ideas started appearing from the Bell, uh, from the B factories to look for these exotics. So one of these was the so-called ISR technique at at Bell Babar. So you have E plus E minus colliding, and then you you emit a, a soft photon, okay, and then uh, so and then uh, you produce again a star, a virtual uh, photon, uh, and that decays into a bunch of hadrons. So the idea was that uh, since this is this, this this X or whatever is going to be produced comes from uh, from uh, uh, from, uh, from from a gamma star that would immediately fix the the, the JPC of of the, of 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 this uh, 3072. So they were really looking to they were hoping that this uh, 3072 would appear. That didn't happen. But what was seen was a much broader 4862 state. Okay, uh, so all I wanted to point at this point is, is that this 4862 has not been seen in BTKs. Okay, it's most probably a non, non it, it's, it's certainly a non CC bar candidate, most probably a hybrid candidate. So moving on to charm, uh, tetraquarks. So a host of ZC states have decaying to GSI pi or Cy, uh, pi has been seen, uh, has been seen since uh, 2008 from uh, when Bell first saw this thing. So now compared to the neutral guys, this is this is like manifestly non QQ bar since the simplest balance quark configuration is CC bar U, UD bar. So and also I should point out that no ZCS that, that decays to GCIK has been seen yet. So among these guys, the most famous is 4430, okay, which mysteriously couples strongly to psi 2s pi instead of 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 of, of the G, of G psi pi, which is uh, normally uh, expect. And uh, Bell, uh, sorry, LHCB in 2014 did a full multidimensional angular analysis. It it it, uh, it fixed the JPC of this guy and also uh, also saw a very nice uh, you know phase motion of of C4430, uh, a bright Wigner like uh, phase motion. For this. So and uh, not only that, so LHCB now has seen uh, exotics in the JSI mode, which is B0 to JSI K pi. Uh, so there are two of these things, uh, 4200 and 4600. That was actually my paper. So, so, so these things are are coming out. I mean, okay. So, so there is a uh, a lot of these better quarks that are appearing. So, uh, this is not quite related to the to the to to, to what can be done at, at G Lab, but I just wanted to point out because this is new uh, new result. So, uh, so fully heavy better quarks. So, this is where all of the four quarks and and quarks are are basically heavy. So. Heavy B and C, so they they have been they have been predicted many, in many QCD models. So the the all heavy uh, B version, uh, uh, the the beauty version was actually searched searched both at LHCB and CMS. So with uh, with, with the current data, we didn't find anything, but more searches are going on. So now recently, LHCB has uh, has has looked at prompt DIGSI search, so PP collisions. Prompt DIGSI uh, search shows clear evidence of of structures. So uh, certainly a peak at 6.9 Jev, which with a possible uh, fully heavy uh, charm uh, tetraquark interpretation. So the, the mass fits are shown below. I do not have time to go over all of them, but uh, essentially the difference between the, between the two, two plots are essentially how you take into account interference between uh, this, uh, this, this tetraquark and possible tetraquark and an ongoing non-resonant processes. But uh, certainly there is, a, there, is a, there is a very strong peak. So some takeaways from from tetraquarks. So so now we know that uh, the the non QP bar states are are basically ubiquitous in, in charm compared to light quark systems. Uh, so uh, so what's what's the difference between a light and heavy here? So probably a simple square well potential picture might be illustrative. So if you look at the kinetic energy term that goes as inverse of one over 
Q. So this means that if, you, if, 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 if the quark is heavy, uh, the kinetic energy term is, is, is lower, and that helps in better binding. And again, uh, so the production mechanisms pr for, for these XYZ states clearly vary case by case. So those even B decays do not, do not appear in E plus minus collisions and, and vice versa. Uh, so, so, uh, so really the, it, it's very much depending on, 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 on particular XYZ state you're looking at. So moving on to pentaquark satellite CB. So this is a, an actual event display of, of lambda B decaying to GSI K pi. So GSI decays to two meons and those be by the green lines, uh, tracks and uh, proton and kion. So a brief introduction to, to, to the LHC uh, since, uh, since uh, Lab. So we are, as probably everybody knows, uh, we, are, we are just outside Geneva, uh, beautiful Alps. And there are four large collaborations in detectors, LHCB, Atlas, CMS, and Alice. And we are colliding uh, protons, uh, protons at 7, 8, and uh, 13 dev till now. So LHCB is, is the Hadron uh, E factory. Uh, and uh, so, so Atlas and CMS are, are, are general purpose detectors. They are interested in heavy objects like the Higgs and dev scale new particles. Uh, while uh, while uh, while B physics, the B particles are, are relatively light compared to what we are colliding. Okay, so it's uh, a B mass is just around uh, five five Jeff. So which means that the B particles are highly boosted. Okay, so that is why LHCb is a forward spectrometer. So this is quite different from from typically what we uh, other detectors for Bell, Babar, CMS, Atlas, or, or even Class, right? Uh, class six, I mean. Uh, uh, so LHCb is, is is very forward. And uh, so compared to E plus E minus colliders like Babar, Bell, and Best3, so the production cross-sections are huge. Okay, so BB bar, CC bar. But of course, we have a, a huge amount of background. The triggering for us is critical. Okay, so that's, 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 that's the whole game that you need to be able to trigger uh, smartly. Uh, so how do you do that? How do you build background? So one of the things is, is precise vertexing. Uh, so these, uh, these B particles, they decay weakly, and so they fly. And so the idea is that you, if you if you locate the, the displaced B, B decay vertex, and that allows you to separate from from the background. So we have a dedicated detector which does a sub detector which does that. That's a silicon vertex detector called VLO, uh, vertex locator, that really surrounds the collision point. And this is this is this thing actually moves. Okay. So when the beam is inserted, it it comes out, and then uh, and then once you you go to stable beam, the VLO moves in and comes very close to the to, 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 the, to the beam line, okay, so around eight millimeters. And so we can resolve uh, the, the, the DK vertices around 15 micrometer, because, and this is actually needed, and it's critical for between BS oscillations and so on. So LHCB is primed to do flavor physics. So we have trapeze uh, that, uh, that allow very good uh, mass resolution for, for the reconstructed bees. We have the calorimeter. Uh, the mion is very important for us because, for example, many of these modes, uh, including uh, uh, the lambda B to GSIPK uh, have dimions appearing. So we have very good efficiency in, in, in trigger and also by mu miss ID. And uh, another thing that we have is uh, are these two rich detectors that allow for excellent K pi proton separation over a wide range of, of kinematic uh, of momentum uh, range. So the rich and the velo systems are rather unique to LHCB at, LHC, at, at the LHC, and there is no rich for, 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 for Atlas and CMS. This actually uh, has an effect, as I will mention. So, uh, till uh, so, we took data from 2011 till 2000. If you if you listen to LHC talks, we always talk about run one, run two. Uh, so that's the run period, and also the the the, the, the square root s. So uh, so we moved from uh, from a seven and eight div to to thirteen div in run two, and so we collected around a nine percent of bond. So uh, this is roughly ninety percent efficient on what LHC. Uh, delivered to us. Okay, so uh, so starting to on pentaquarks. Uh, so uh, the pentaquark that uh, the Lambda B pentaquark was really a serendipitous discovery. Uh, so the analysis uh, that was that found this was investigating a completely different problem, Lambda B lifetime. So uh, heavy quark symmetry basically tells you that uh, all the hadron species have comparable life lifetimes. Basically, you are probing the properties of, of the B uh, of the B quark itself. While uh, all the tetron me measurements found that uh, the ratio of the, of the lambda b to b meson lifetime was actually smaller than one, okay, and this was uh, this was a conundrum for some time, and LHCB paper, LHCB paper resolved this thing, and 
found that we are consistent with HQS. So, and the mode that was used was lambda B to JSIPK. And when they were doing this analysis, they found this, you know, very strange uh, band, okay, in, in, in JSIP. And for a long time, uh, you know, <laughs> we have things in the mailing list which says, ah, oh, don't worry about it, it's just reflection, okay? And and uh, and uh, partly because this, this, this you know, uh, Pentaquarks are aware of sort of a taboo uh, thing that, you know, they'd be very, very careful in claiming anything. So uh, one thing which was very clear that, that bump hunting would not work, you really need to do a full angular analysis. So uh, the 20, 2015 analysis, so the, the signal itself, lambda B to just high to K is very clean, okay? So this was run one at 26K, very well reconstructed events. The problem was that the, that the dominant physics background is conventional lambda star. So that's a lambda star going to be K. So you have a very small uh, uh, lambda B to, uh, so to, to PC K happening. So, so we do not, we have a, a lot of physics background. So that's, that's, the main problem. So uh, we did a, a full angular analysis. This is a full six-dimensional angular analysis uh, using the helicity formalism. And you also need to allow for the fact that the lambda b can be polarized. Uh, it's a different thing that the lambda, lambda b is actually not polarized in the b. But OK, so there are two chains. One is the pentaquark chain, so lambda b to k. And there's also the lambda star dk chain. And you need to be uh, to be especially careful because now you have final states, the the two neons and the proton, uh, which which are which have spins. Okay, so and when you have multiple DK chains, it's always uh, uh, you, you know you have to you have to make additional rotations to align the spins. But okay, so all of this was actually done, and and uh, so so I mean we by this time we were, we already had a lot of experience in in that in, in the Z4430 uh, analysis. So this uh, we had uh, uh, the expertise to do these things. So, okay, so the state is still 2015, and I, I point out that this is now a superseded, this result is superseded, was that the amplitude analysis gave two, two, two pentaquark states with opposite parities. There was a narrow 4450 and a broad 4380. And for the narrow one, 4450, we could even uh, see a resonance-like phase motion for the, for the narrow guy. So then a bunch of uh, additional checks was done uh, so, uh, the, 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 I mean, one of the main problems was uh, what's the effect of, of modeling the, the, the complicated lambda star uh, the, uh, resonances. So, uh, what you do was that, uh, so we, we, we came up with a model independent validation of exotics by, 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 uh, by looking at the helicity angle, okay, so of, of the k on in the lambda star rest stream. And so, you, you, you pull out the, the, the angular moments from the data itself. Okay, and then you you project onto the on GSI P uh, 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 kinematic variable, and you try to see if if there's any way that these lambda stars can mimic a sharp peak. And basically, what we found is that this is just uh, not possible. It's rejected at ten sigma, uh, more than ten sigma. So so there's no way that you can have a lambda stars uh, concocting up uh, uh, this peak. Or, or, uh, okay, and uh, just to point out that the similar methods have been used in other other uh, other exotic searches in the VT case. Okay, so we also looked at the Kibibo suppressed lambda B to G side high mode, and uh, so here instead of lambda stars, we have n stars, and so uh, so uh, you which which are dominating, and so to veto that, we look at the high mass region, and uh, so all I would like to say here is that uh, you know, the data is consistent with. With, uh, or rather, was consistent with uh, what what we saw in GSIPK. So it's not an independent uh, because it's Kibibo suppressed. There's, there's much lower statistics. Okay. So especially once you veto the the, the, the dominant n stars, you can see that uh, the data is consistent with requiring the, the same pentaquarks. Okay. Very good. So in last year, we published a reanalysis re with pentaquark. Uh, and uh, with improved selections, uh, and uh, we had additional luminosity, and also uh, we were collecting data at higher cross section. So, so in all, uh, so uh, so so with with complete run one run two, we had almost nine times the, the the statistics that we had in 2015. So, so you can you can play play around a lot more, and especially it turns out that uh, being able to bin finally uh, reveals uh, PC substructures. So the new picture is is is, is that so again as we, to suppress lambda star you can, you can do two things one is that you place a cut on on lambda star mass or I I don't want to go into the details because 
time, but there's a method you can you you basically reweight using one over cos theta, uh, where, where theta is the helicity angle, but it's the same sort of the same effect. Okay, so once you 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 try to suppress the the, the dominant lambda does, uh, uh, so um, uh, so there are, there are two main results. One is that we see a new PC4312, uh, okay, very very narrow, and then the older 4450 uh, resolves into two uh, two uh, substructure states uh, 4440 and 4457. So this was a 1D fit. It was not sensitive to the broad 4380 that that I mentioned before. Okay. So uh, one of the things that we learned from tetra quark uh, study, studies was that once you see these peaks, the first thing that you do is you you ask are there any thresholds? Are these these peaks close to any thresholds? In fact, there are uh, several thresholds. I mean, chi C one P and the lambda C uh, D, D D star. But uh, theoretically, the one that's 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 supposed to play a, uh, a, a role is the chi C PD star threshold. So both the so 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 both these uh, things are actually close to chi C D zero and chi C uh, D star zero thresholds. And uh, in fact, uh, previous uh, meson baryon uh, molecule uh, theoretical models predicted. Uh, states, narrow states in these regions, and they also predicted the GPC, uh, GP of these states. Okay, and for so 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 looking at our data, so it's not just the 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 chi c, uh, sorry, it's the sigma c d. Uh, so the, these people also also predicted states close to the to the sigma star d d star. Okay. So they have done uh, fits. Uh, so 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 you might be, there might even be states. Uh, it might be a narrow 4380, narrow one, not the older one. Uh, corresponding to the sigma star d threshold. Okay, so more on the narrow widths. So uh, because these guys are narrows, the decay of these you know, of the PC must be suppressed in some manner. And uh, so in this loosely bound pentacore uh, hypothesis, uh, this is sort of easier to explain because now the CC bar are in different confinement volumes, so they can't easily come together from a, from a GSA. In the tightly bound pentacork uh, uh, hypothesis, this is this is uh, this is not that easy. So 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 uh, it, this would this would decay immediately. Uh, so that's uh, but there are other models which can have uh, narrow states produced from from tightly bound pentacorks as well. Okay, the other thing is uh, is the line shape and cusps and triangle singularities. So okay, so what's a triangle sing singularity? Basically, what's happening is that you have lambda b, b coming in, and what what goes out is a k, a k on proton and gsi. Okay, and so uh, so yeah, so what must happen to have a cusp effect is that uh, all, all all three legs must close to on shell. Okay, so okay, and then uh, uh, whatever is being 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 rescattered in m3 and m4, they come together to form. Uh, the proton uh, GSI proton, and that's the pentacork. And you can produce; uh, re they basically rescatter to produce a cusp right at the at the ends at the mass of uh, MC plus M4. So, uh, so now the 4312 and the 4440 are are not really close to any such threshold, but the 4457 is okay, and it's close to lambda C uh, D uh, 20, 2595 uh, D threshold. So we tried that fit. So basically, you replace the bright wigner by this cusp line shape, and we found a reasonable fit. It's not as good as that with a bright wigner, but this this can improve with with uh, with the full angular analysis. And we got a reasonable fit if you're exchanging a DS1 2860 in in the, in the channel. Okay, so it can be a cusp. So, so the 4457 can be a cusp. Okay, so uh, so not just LHCb, uh, Atlas and CMS also have. They are very interested in in searches. Plus has searched in lambda b to gsi bk as i mentioned uh, it's it, these searches are hard for them because essentially the gsi is is, is clean okay that's not a problem but the, if you cannot separate uh, protons on kaons it's it's a very different ball game okay you can, you can just compare what their lambda b mass looks compared to its cb so it's really very hard and in this analysis in particular i mean it's it's amazing that they actually did this given uh, Quality of, uh, of of I mean the problem comes because of this uh, you don't have rich so the, the what they found was that uh, it, the fit certainly improves if you include the LHCP pentacorks but they, the data cannot still rule out the null hypothesis so moving to other pentacork searches uh, exotic searches in BS to GSIPP bar so uh, so these are this is a dibaryon uh, DK of, of, of from BDKs. And these are, are are suppressed, and the suppression comes. So if you if you want to look for pentacores from BDK, is obviously you need 
you know, a B and a B, uh, sorry, a, a, a baryon and, and an antibaryon. So this just immediately kills your phase piece. So now these decays also, in addition, are Kabibu or, or Aussie suppressed. Okay, so B, B sub S is Aussie suppressed, while B0 is Kabibu suppressed. So these are typically very rare decays. And so uh, LHCB had actually looked at this a long time back, and the, and the interesting thing then was there seems to be this, uh, this universal uh, threshold enhancement in, 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 in the dibaryon mass from many different BDKs, okay? And for PP bar, the, the, the interest has always been that is there a glue ball in bar? But once, uh, you know, Pentaquarks came up, there obviously uh, this is the, the, the sort of the thrust uh, changes a little bit. So do we have a Pentaquark from a BDK? <clears throat> Okay, so uh, now uh, CD models uh, predict that Aussie suppression really dominates. So that means that you, you expect to see more B0s than BSs, okay? And the suppression can be lifted if you have a pentacork or a glue ball, of course. So uh, the 2000, 2013 paper, uh, they did not give an, give an observation. But one thing it noticed was that it seems that there are more BSs than B0, okay? So this inverted hierarchy was. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there were there were hints for this. Okay. So now, uh, so this is again my analysis. Uh, so this we published last year with with not the full run to data set. So we have more data now. So we improved the selections. We have a have a more powerful uh, BDT, including proton PID and uh, and and kinematic variables and so on. So this is the first observation. Now we see these things very clearly. Okay. And uh, so uh, we 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 confirm this inverted hierarchy that. We, you see more BSs than B0. Uh, so the, I mean, so something is going on with uh, BS then that, that, that's not happening to B0, okay? So we, okay. So, uh, so, 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 so the other thing about this, this mode is that, remember, unlike uh, lambda B to just a PK, this production mode is, is very, it doesn't have physics backgrounds because there are not really that many mesons that DK to PP bar. So it's mostly like phase space, okay? non-resonant phase space. Uh, production mechanism. So if you have a pentacork pente that would really dominate, also the, the, the topology is rather unique. If there's a pentacork, it will appear in both legs, both GSIP and GSIP bar. So you expect a very, very, very unique interference pattern in the dollar spring. So the, the, so the angular analysis uh, is ongoing on full run one, run two. We hopefully so we, will, we will be able to publish uh, by this year. So other PC searches at the LHC. So as you can probably imagine, this is this is now a whole industry uh, at LHC. There's a huge amount of that going on. So we want to update the lambda B to GSIP pi, and of course the full angular analysis for 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 PK GSIP keys is coming up. So uh, so we also are looking at, uh, for example, B plus to GSI lambda bar P. Uh, so and uh, and remember, like I said, the 4457 could be a, a lambda C D D zero cusp. So we want to check if we can see this in direct production. So lambda b to, to lambda c plus uh, d, uh, d and d star k, uh, if we see direct production. Uh, we also are looking, searching for prompt PC production, then uh, pentaquarks in other CC bar states, chi c1 p pi, uh, and then uh, lambda b to chi c, uh, c plus plus, uh, sorry, sigma c, uh, d, d d star uh, k minus. Uh, Atlas and CMS are also looking. Uh, so CMS has now published B plus to JSI lambda bar uh, proton and then uh, JSI lambda phi phi. So now w once you once you have lambdas lambda zero that decays that 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 flies and decays into P pi or a phi that's you know which is very very narrow uh, mass window. So those things Atlas and CMS can do, okay? Because uh, you don't really need hadron PID, PID because the signatures come from elsewhere. So those things they can do. And uh, Atlas and CMS has actually much larger luminosities because they were they were collecting uh, uh, at at a higher luminosity than than LHCb. So they have a lot of data. So we you know they are also competitive here. So looking ahead, LHCb upgrades. So spectroscopy is very important at LHCb, and we have a huge program. So we need to collect much more data. Uh, so we have a staged upgrade towards 300 inverse femtobonds, or so almost you know uh, 100 times more data that we have now. Uh, uh, okay, uh, so so this will be a stage upgrade. Uh, so right now we are in in, in so-called long shutdown, uh, long LS LS2, uh, and when we start up in next year, we will have a brand new detector almost. Uh, and uh, this was required because uh, right now we have what is called the hardware level zero trigger, which is a bottleneck. So we want to read out the entire detector at full 40 megahertz, 
and we will switch to full versatile online software triggering. And so, 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 so we expect to collect a lot of, of more, more events. Okay, so, so to summarize exotics, uh, so, uh, so I hope I, I was able to give this impression that uh, exotics do seem to prefer heavy quark systems and then all over the place. And LHCB continues to shape the field with in both uh, tetraquark and pentaquark discoveries. Now, uh, so this is a very nice plot from 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 Bluex, and uh, we are this is uh, we are very interested in what the, what you guys see. So uh, I think there is no real reason that the pentaquarks that we see in BD case will be the same thing as in JLAD. And another thing which uh, I think this is the lesson that we that, that I sort of learned from from high for, for the production is that you really need to look at full angular uh, coverage at what what's going on at the large angles, and maybe you know Gluex can might try to do even gamma p to gsi pi and missing neutron that would that would allow you to to look for isospin partners neutralize uh, pentaquarks uh, isospin partners of, of what of the charged ones, and also you might be able to do uh, tetraquarks just because now you have gsi pi, so okay. So we really look forward to 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 seeing what JLF finds. It's very important and very interesting. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Big Lab. Very nice talk. Uh, we have several questions in the question box. First is from Victor Mokayev, who says, "Why in the pi pi mass, the p pi mass distribution, there is no contribution from delta resonances?" Uh, uh, I I think that's because of of uh, isospin, right? And because of the isospin of the of the, of the mother lambda b. If I okay, yeah. Um, let's move on. If people want more clarification, you can ask another question. Igor Trakovsky says, thank you, Biplab, for a nice overview. Your interpretation of the CERN five quark state on page 20 of your presentation confused me. There is no pole position, which is the main signature of a resonance. And then how can you talk about a model independent result? Uh, ah, okay. So what I meant, well, remember, I, 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 I uh, so the slide, uh, I, I am very clear that this is what this establishes model independent validation of exotic behavior. So you're completely right that this does not fix the pole at all. It just says that this whatever is happening, you, you independent of what you assume in the line as conventional lambda stars, you cannot explain data with just conventional resonances. It's completely true that this does not uh, this does not say anything about uh, what is the nature of of the exotic uh, behavior. It just tells you that uh, you know uh, this is this is uh, it cannot be conventional resonance. That's that's the, that's the title as well. Okay. Um, next question from Adam. If you quote that piece C four three one two is a Mason Baryon molecule, Barry I suggest to also look at the analysis by J Pack of the PC4312 LHCB line shape model independent, which demonstrates that it is not a bound state, but a virtual state. Uh, sure, sure. I mean, uh, you know, this is, uh, this, okay, uh, I have to look it up, but I mean, this is, uh, we obviously need to do a full angle. Of it. Basically, we need to, uh, to find out the JPC. JPs of these of these things, but uh, at least uh, you know this is one. Uh, uh, sure, I mean uh, it can be. I mean, like I said, you you can have uh, bound uh, pentaquark models that also uh, can, can can show that it's narrow, but uh, you really need to do the thin parity analysis for that, which is ongoing. Okay. Um, if people want to ask more, they can ask more questions. Unfortunately, we can't have a dialogue here. Uh, so Lubomir Penchev has the last question so far, and he says, nice talk. Uh, answer to the last slide question is Gluex can try JSI pi, P, sorry, 
can try JSI Pi Plus and exclusive photo production. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, I thought that you could not detect uh, the neutron. That's what I meant. Yes, it is exclusive. It's just reconstructed as a missing body, right? That's what I meant. Yeah, I think I think GLUX doesn't have an, a dedicated neutron detector, but every calorimeter. Yeah, I, I, I understand. Neutron, that. Right. I also meant an exclusive for photo production as well. It's just that within brackets is that this guy is not detected. Yeah. I think it's talking about the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. The the neutron detection will have some threshold. That could be the. Oh. Okay. Um, consideration in, in any calorimeter you can always detect neutrons at some level but at, with a higher threshold than a dedicated neutron detector okay, okay. any other comments or questions we're slightly over time thank you for, for the nice talk and we uh, i guess we shall move on to sylvester thank you very much if you can stop sharing and Sylvester can start sharing and unmute. Okay. Um. So we see your video and we hear your audio. It's good. Start. That's a start. I know. Uh, could you point me to where the button is to share my screen? I kind of assumed it was right next to your. Hey Sylvester, it's on the right hand side and it looks like the Windows image icon. Oh, there we go. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, can you make sure you click hide for that bar at the top? There you go. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, I'll be following the previous talk with some, uh, you know, sort of a preview of uh, experimental results uh, uh, related to the pentaquark uh, from the Halsey pentaquark search experiment. Um, so just a bit of a recap. I know we don't need much of a recap because we just got a very nice presentation about this. Uh, but uh, just to sort of frame the history of how this experiment was designed and, you know, the things that happened in the meantime and how we, we adapted to it and uh, what we will be able to expect from the experiment. Uh, I, th I think it's relevant to go through this. So um, just as a recap, in uh, uh, 2015, the LHEB experiment announced that it found these two uh, resonances in the lambda BDK uh, spectrum that are consistent with pentaquark states. Um, the spin parity was not fully constrained. Um, uh, at the time, the most likely assumption was five, five half plus and three half minus, where they had uh, uh, both states at opposite uh, parity. Um, so there were a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of different possible explanations for what was what was observed in 2015. Um, you know, there's definitely something in the spectrum. There was so many sigmas uh, away from there not being any kind of uh, peak. Um, but it's, of course, unclear if it's really a pentaquark. So, you know, there were at the time two uh, major explanations. Either it's some kind of new state, it could be a pentaquark state, it could be some kind of molecular state, um, either really, you know, something, um, some molecular state that is more similar to a nucleus where there's some kind of pi and or rho exchange that can happen in the binding, or maybe some kind of heterotermonium state where you, for example, have a, a, a side prime that's bound with a proton uh, where the, the, the uh, interaction would be purely gluonic. Alternatively, if it's not a real state, you would expect uh, it could be explained with, by kinematic enhancements through the anomalous triangle singularity, um, as the previous speaker uh, very nicely uh, showed. Um, Photo production, we realized, was a really good tool to try to distinguish between uh, these two assumptions. Because if it's really a new, uh, a, a truly new state, especially if it's really a five quark state, you would expect to be able to easily produce them in photo production through the S channel. Whereas uh, alternatively, the alternative, uh, the uh, anomalous triangle singularity is not possible in photo production. And uh, the uh, 2015 narrow pentaquark states uh, translates in a very narrow peak around uh, 
a photon energy of 10.1 GeV, which is perfectly within reach of uh, Jefferson Lab. So it's the perfect place to start uh, trying to study these in a completely different channel. Uh, the channel that we would look at is quarkonium photoproduction. Uh, some basics about this is uh, the uh, uh, in normal D-channel uh, quarkonium uh, photoproduction, uh, you have uh, an angular dependence that is uh, preferably in the forward direction, meaning that uh, preferably the uh, uh, JSI gets created in the direction of the uh, with the photon. Uh, and the T-dependence uh, historically has been pretty well described by an exponential or maybe more accurately by a dipole shape, um, where really you go you go up very, very strongly towards T-min, while uh, there's almost nothing here at T-max where the JSI is produced backwards. This is something that we can leverage to try to maximize the sensitivity to S-channel resonances within this channel. Um, as you can see on the left here with the diagram, you have a standard uh, two gluon T channel uh, GSI production. Uh, that kind of diagram works well at higher energies. And then here you have a potential contribution by an S channel resonance. Um, if this S channel resonance goes through a pentaquark state, then we have a state where here this right coupling is uh, mostly constrained by what uh, was uh, measured at LHCB. Um, of course, we have here a second coupling. Uh, with which through the quantum numbers we know should happen uh, through the photon uh, proton channel however it's heavily model dependent exactly how big this coupling is typically we're quite optimistic and we say it happens through the cc bar pole so it should be the same or about the same um, but really there's an entire range of couplings that are possible that uh, that will determine our sensitivity to this so really to maximize this sensitivity what we need to do is we have this this rapidly falling T-channel cross-section, and um, we have an S-channel cross-section that has a completely different angular dependence. Uh, for example, in the case of a three-half uh, uh, spin uh, pentaquark, you would expect uh, that it would decay into a you know JSIP and an S-wave, so it's uh, going to be a, uh, a constant uh, T-dependence versus a very falling T -dependence, strong falling T-dependence. So by having a measurement that reaches all the way to high T, we can get the maximum sensitivity to see if we notice any kind of flattening out of the T dependence when we pass through the resonances. Of course, this requires very high luminosity. Um, some other physics that we can measure when we really measure, map out this T dependence from low T to high T um, um, includes uh, the origin of the nuclear mass. And let me just take this little detour here. So 99% uh, of the mass of the uh, visible universe um, is uh, made out of protons and neutrons. However, protons and neutrons are made out of quarks that only, if you add up their mass, make up about 1% of the total proton mass. Um, and it's been known since the 80s from various different uh, calculation techniques. Here at the left, I illustrate tyson schwinger equations and lattice QCD that even in the chiral limit, if uh, you assume that the uh, uh, quarks are massless, the uh, constituent quarks still accumulate about 300 MeV per uh, constituent quark uh, by absorbing the gluon field that surrounds them, which means that in the chiral limit, we get mass from nothing and the Higgs mechanism really doesn't matter that much uh, when it comes to trying to understand the proton mass. Um, and as you all are aware, this is a very hot topic and it's something that will be extensively studied uh, at the Electron Ion Collider. And it was identified by the NES uh, as uh, one of the key uh, questions that we can uh, study at uh, such a machine. So then the, the question is, why does this actually happen? How can we understand this? And one way to look at this is by uh, looking at the uh, uh, trace of the energy and momentum tensor at zero momentum transfer, which can be quite uh, elegantly related uh, to two times the square of the proton mass. Um, if we take this uh, trace of the energy momentum tensor and we uh, look at the low momentum transfer case, we see that you get this uh, decoupling between heavy quarks and light quarks, where the heavy quark term gets absorbed in this beta tilde function that's multiplied by g squared, um, plus a contribution from light quark mass. Now, this contribution from light quark mass goes to zero if we go to the chiral limit. So we know that just by looking at this form, that really the proton mass is uh, heavily determined by 
exactly what happens with this uh, trace anomaly matrix element. Um, I also want to point out this is, uh, you know, it's very interesting to study this both uh, when looking at protons, but also when looking at the trace anomaly in pions, because pions are the uh, uh, Goldstein boson of uh, dynamic chiral symmetry breaking, meaning that they should be massless in the chiral limit. And therefore, this contribution that becomes so big to really set the scale of the proton mass um, goes to zero in pions. So this is really intimately related to uh, the emergence of scale itself. So can we measure the trace anomaly? Well, um, if we make a couple of sub observations, we can get an idea of how we get, get some sensitivity to this. Well, j size and also epsilons, they only really couple to gluons, not to light quarks. Um, so they are supremely sensitive to the gluonic structure of the proton. The trace anomaly operator is very hard to measure because it's a twist four operator, meaning it's extremely highly suppressed and high energy scattering. And there's also, uh, you know, still a lot of theoretical work that needs to be done to really be able to separate this, although a lot of progress has been made in the last years in this front. Um, but the solution can be found in low energy scattering where the contribution from this uh, operator becomes larger. And that translates uh, into JSI production in the threshold region where we get uh, sensitivity. Um, another topic that uh, we are sensitive to in the threshold region is the nature of the colonic van der Waals force. This is a predicted force, uh, colon neutral, between the crawler or neutral JSI and the nucleon that is uh, purely from colonic in nature. Um, we can uh, extract this by uh, determining the S-wave uh, scattering length of, uh, uh, from uh, exclusive uh, JSI production, um, which, by the way, is strongly linked with the, uh, the nature of the trace anomaly itself. Current estimates uh, are in a pretty wide range. Um, really, what we need is uh, more data um, of precise T-dependences as close to threshold as we can get. So what did we know before Jefferson Lab about uh, quarkonium photoproduction in the threshold region? Well, as you can see from this figure, which is kind of blown up to make the point really strongly, is that this is like a, it's a desert region. We really don't know, didn't know anything about the near threshold region. There was um, uh, no photo, uh, no photo production or electro data production data available. Um, uh, near threshold, there's actually no real electro production data available at uh, high energies either. So um, this region, which holds so such a big treasure trove of uh, physics topics, origin of proton mass, Wally van der Waals force, uh, maybe quarkonium nucleon or nucleus bound states, and mechanism for quarkonium production itself, pentaquarks, um, this, this region can really be unlocked at Jefferson Lab. So it's, it's a very exciting time. Um, so, going back to the pentaquark. Uh, so, in uh, 2015, the LHB collaboration announced uh, the, their uh, discovery of those resonances in the lambda B uh, decay spectrum. In 2016, uh, we uh, proposed an experiment in Hall C uh, to try to look for this uh, resonance. Um, the experiment was to use a very high intensity and real photon beam using a 9% copper radiator, a 10 centimeter liquid hydrogen target, and would detect uh, JSI decay leptons in coincidence. Um, because we're sitting at the Bremsstrahlung tip, we can get a clean measurement where we fully constrain the photon energy through the uh, decay uh, JSI. We would run this in two different types of configurations, symmetric to go to low T and uh, measure the T-channel cross-section at low T, and then asymmetric to map out the high T region, which is extremely hard to measure in other experiments where you don't have this type of uh, luminosity. And I also want to point out that this is really a very old fashioned way of doing this measurement. There's a lot of sim similarities to the measurements that really um, measured some of the key parameters of JSI production in the uh, mid seventies. Of course, we ran the experiment in uh, February 2019, and right after they ran the experiment, the LHCB collaboration uh, announced their new results, which included 10 times the statistics, and which uh, found a third pentaquark state and resolved the two, uh, the one narrow pentaquark state and two even narrower pentaquark states. And of course, this has an impact on our uh, sensitivity to this measurement because a narrower state means that uh, it doesn't. It couples less to the uh, 
you know, it, it's less likely to decay to the JSIP channel, meaning that uh, we would favor a much smaller coupling and therefore it would show up much less in our cross section. So this, uh, it really, it really uh, requires us to get very high statistics in the high tier region. Um, one way to interpret this is that, uh, you know, the, the data right now are much more consistent or intuitively consistent with a loosely bound, uh, you know, nucleus like uh, pentaquark molecule rather than a real pentaquark state. Um, although, of course, there is a very big spectrum of different uh, theoretical explanations still out there, and we really need data in as many different channels as we can get to understand what is going on. So, in the uh, JSI experiment, we ultimately ran four different settings, um, two low T settings that are over here in this plot of photon energy versus uh, the uh, difference between T and T min. And you see for those two, uh, with those two settings, we cover, uh, we cover a photon energy range between 9.1 GeV and 10.6 GeV. And uh, um, we go up to T to about 0.8 to one. Um, and then we have two settings that are an estimate, we're taking asymmetric configurations where we cover the uh, phase space uh, for high T and where in the really high T setting, we go, uh, we go up to a T of about uh, five. Um, and as you can see, uh, you know, I placed this, uh, I rotated this cartoon I showed earlier um, here on the left side of the plot to show that really, you know, for those low T settings, we, we measure this, uh, uh, the low T region, and then as we go up here, we measure this resonance, and we go up very far in the region of these resonances, which are indicated by these uh, pink lines, um, meaning that we have a good sensitivity even if this light slides down further and further, th uh, this green line, um, in the case of a very small coupling. So after the announcement of uh, the LHCB, um, Blue X uh, published their first uh, JSI results. Uh, where they published a very nice 1D cross-section measurement, a uh, total of uh, the paper quoted 469 estimated counts. Um, they also released a one-dimensional integrated T dependence uh, for photon energies between 10 to 11.8 GeV. Um, some interesting features is that uh, you can see from these points that it really trends significantly higher than the old data points. Um, but there is a large 27% scale uncertainty that is inherent in Blue X not being the ideal machine to measure an absolute cross section. And there's actually a very nice synergy here with the LC results where we uh, measure in a narrower region because we have less acceptance, but we have a setup that is very well uh, suited to get an absolute cross section out. Um, uh, at uh, the GLUX paper also uh, published uh, upper limits for um, certain types of S-channel resonances at a 90% confidence level, but they also mentioned that their data are still consistent with, uh, for example, uh, molecular uh, models. So what are some features of the whole C measurement? I already uh, pointed out we have these four settings that we map out the phase space in 2D. Each of these boxes really corresponds to a single bin. Um, we have the largest data set of JSI produced with a real photon beam uh, in the world, where we have about 4,200 counts. Um, the experiment was designed to measure electrons because the spectrometers are very good at that, but it turns out that we were also able to separate the muon signal and double our statistics with this. Um, we have a 2D cross-section in photo production between 9.1 and 10.6 GeV. Our four settings really cover the entire phase space where important. We have a high T and rich sample. We spent most of our time measuring really in the green and the red settings, um, which means that uh, you would have to take an enormous amount of luminosity at large acceptance detectors to get uh, a, a similar type of uh, uh, statistics in this region. Um, so this is really unique to Hall C and not something that's really possible anywhere else. Um, we can combine the data from all these settings to get maximum sensitivity to the pentaquark and uh, uh, our experiment really covers the full range between this peak, this peak, and this peak, so all three uh, pentacore uh, candidates. And if there is another peak that people want to uh, to study, we also cover the intermediate range, and we're really, you know, nicely 2D. So this is a plot that I showed last year already, just to show that we understand the signal shape very well from the Monte Carlo, um, uh, where we uh, 
have a model of the radiator. We have a realistic target that we simulate and we do radiative corrections using photos, similar to what uh, GLUX uh, does. Um, our signal is well described by the Monte Carlo. Background is dominated for the electron channel by uh, pi and electro production and for the muon channel by uh, two pi and production. Beta hydro contamination is very small because we're sitting at very large angles with our spectrometers. And we took data with an open trigger, meaning we get the background shape from real data. And this is something that you can see here on the plots to the left. So on the plot to the left, you can see um, for our first uh, kinematic setting, which has the highest statistics, um, the, at the top, you see the electron channel, and at the bottom, you see the dimion channel. Um, the electron channel has very little background, and this background shape is um, directly measured by us and just scaled to the sidebands of the JSI. Same thing here for the muon channel. We measure the pi pi background that doesn't include muons and then scale that to the uh, background. And you can see we get a really a perfect description and we get a very nice, uh, very nice peak out of it. And what is very powerful is that really these electron and muon channels are independent measurements. They're independent experiments, really. They have the same statistics, but completely different systematics. So for the electrons, we have very low backgrounds because we have a uh, very good PID through uh, the Trenkov and uh, colorimeter system in the HMS and SHMS. Um, however, they undergo multiple scattering and are more sensitive to radiative uh, losses. And uh, because of that, we get a slightly worse resolution of 10 MeV. For muons, there is uh, more background, of course, because um, to do this measurement, especially to do it for all the phases, we can't rely on any of the Trenkov. So we really have to use the colorimeter system where we have four layers in the HMS and two layers in the super HMS. Um, to uh, to try to distinguish them from pions, which works surprisingly well. Um, I was not very hopeful when we started looking at this um, because the spectrometers are not set up to measure muons. But um, it turns out if we do this have a, and have the standard coincidence time requirements for the events, the background mostly disappears. Um, background is dominated by two pion events. We can still get the shape from the data set. Uh, we're less sensitive to multiple scattering or radiative losses, and we have a better resolution because of that of the MEV. And uh, I just wanted to, uh, to highlight uh, we found a very nice position between the different settings to be completely stable. And uh, we also uh, can uh, describe uh, the positions very well with uh, what we understand in the Monte Carlo. So here is a sneak preview from results. No uh, labels at the uh, uh, y axis, um, because uh, we still need to undergo collaboration review. So uh, I, I can't just debut, really debut the data here. I show here two bins in photon energy, one uh, at, uh, um, you know, in between the lower and the higher uh, mass uh, pentapark states and one past the pentapark state. I'm not showing a pentapark bin here. Um, and what you can see is the T dependence between our different settings. The different settings are shown in different colors. Um, and the band in the background is just a simple exponential fit to the data, which does a very good job for these two bins to describe the data. And this is really the first ever determination of the T dependence of the cross section in bins of 150 MeV of photon energy. Um, it's uh, highly sensitive to the presence of an S channel resonance because uh, we really have a very good acceptance in this region and spend a, a lot of uh, luminosity sitting in this region. Um, over here, I'm only showing electron data. Neon data is a separate experiment with the same statistics, which however, will provide an important cross-check and will uh, help us uh, really enhance uh, the sensitivity we can get out of the experiment. So in a nutshell, it's exciting times for JSI near threshold with a very full JLAP uh, program. And um, GLUX has some very nice results that were published last year. Um, in whole C, we have about 4,200 uh, JSI that we uh, measured in two dimensions. Uh, class has uh, multiple experiments measuring J size and their analysis is going, and I'm very excited to see what uh, what they see. And uh, then in solid, which is a next generation uh, experiment uh, for Jefferson Lab, we really um, will be able to uh, to sort of shift the paradigm and go and measure uh, J size not just in electro production, but in direct photo, uh, not just in photo production, but in direct electro production extremely close to the threshold and get sensitivity to cross sections uh, below 10 to the minus three, which really will um, map out the uh, threshold region I would, like no other experiment can do. So conclusions, quarkonium production is really an important tool to study the gluonic fields in the nucleon. 
threshold production of carconium can shed lights on the trace anomaly carconium nucleon or nucleus binding, uh, the LHCb pentaquark, and the origin of the proton mass. The uh, JSI007 experiment is perfectly positioned to significantly contribute to these topics with a first 2D measurement of the JSI cross section near threshold. And we'll be able to answer questions like, you know, is there what evidence do we see for pentaquark states or what kind of limits do we set? What is the uh, binding? Do we see any, uh, you know, can we constrain the binding force between the proton and the JSI uh, from the D dependencies that we measured? And can we uh, understand the apparent discrepancy between the blue X and the old slacking Cornell points? And the analysis is ready to undergo a collaboration review. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sylvester. Very nice talk, very interesting. Um, we have one question at the moment from Igor Strakowski, who says on page seven, uh, you could also have included Karzaev's results, which uh, account for 80% of the nucleon mass as a gluon contribution. Yes, that's that's absolutely true. And uh, it's it's one of the it's one of the works that I I usually show in my in my talks, but I, I had to cut out some things because I mostly wanted to talk about pentaquark here. But that's absolutely a, a very true. Karzaev has really. He's published some of the first papers on, on this uh, topic to try to understand the proton mass uh, in the 90s. And I, I can highly recommend looking at them because they're very pedagogical in the way that he understand, uh, understands them. And actually, I, I, this, this, uh, um, this approach is uh, completely based on what he does, as you, as you can see here. Are there any other questions? Yes, um, from Reinhard Schumacher. What do the gray bands on your results plots represent? Those are an exponential fit to the t-dependence um, with uncertainty. So we would expect the t-dependence for t-channel production to fall roughly exponential. Like at high t, you would expect some dipole contributions. Um, this is a just a simple exponential fit, which gets chi squared very close to one uh, to these points. Okay, now we have two more questions. Uh, Sean Dobbs says, very nice talk and looking forward to the final results. One clarification with the current data, GLUEX sees over 2000 JSI and we continue to take data and you can see Alex's talk tomorrow. So I think that's a comment. Yes, and I'm, 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 a, I'm aware that GLUEX uh, only published, uh, at the time I think it was only 25% of uh, the data. And right now there's, you know, the, the big systematic, uh, you know, there's the big scale uncertainty that's, that's, that makes adding, um, extra statistics, uh, in one dimension at least, uh, maybe not, uh, uh how to best put this. I mean, I just want to emphasize the complementarity because we, you know, with the extra statistics of Blue X and the extra, you know, reach of having a four pi detector versus a small acceptance detector, I think we can really have a very strong combined Jefferson lab result. Um, so. Good. And so far the last question is from Florian Hauenstein. Nice talk, Sylvester. So when do you expect more results in the first publication? Uh, that's going to depend on how long the collaboration review is going to take. Um, but the analysis is in principle ready. Okay, so four months. <laughs> I don't want to say a number. I hope okay. I hope sooner than that. Uh, it's you know it's we have a big collaboration. A lot of people have supported our experiment, and we want to make sure that they all agree that with our uh, analysis approach before we really publicize the results. Okay, very good. Thank you um, for a great talk and uh, for the answers to the questions. And I we're at the break time now. Um, Let's stick to the schedule. Uh, so we lost around five minutes on the break and come back at 10.35. No, I can't do that. Uh, yeah, 10.55, sorry. We have a talk by Maxime. So uh, we'll reconvene at 10.55. Thank you.
Hi, Sylvia. On the right-hand side of your screen, you should see an image icon that kind of looks like the Windows picture icon. That's okay. your share ability. Do you hear me? I do. Okay, great. Already, that's good. So, up, ah, there it is. Okay. Is right. that okay? Yep, I see it. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. You're that's welcome. All I okay, great. Thanks. You're welcome. And just as a reminder, there's a banner at the top or bottom that um, says stop sharing or hide. Click hide mm -hmm. so it doesn't cover any part of your slides. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Lorelai, can you hear me? This is Ed, by the way. I sure can. Okay. I was having a bit of trouble with the uh, AirPods yesterday. But, okay, just wanted to check. Cool. Thanks. You're welcome.
Hi, Maxime. You can go ahead and share your slides if you want. Hi, can you hear me? I absolutely can. Okay, great. So let's try to share the slides. Um, boom, boom, sharing option, share screen. I can see you it. see the slides? Yes, okay, great. Welcome back, everybody. Hi, Maxime. We can see your screen and your video. Hi, great. So uh, I think we should just go ahead and get started. OK, so thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
Uh, today, my talk will be dedicated to the DVCS program with class 12 on the Proton. So, uh, if one wants to study a QCD, uh, there is no better place than uh, looking inside the nucleon. So, we all know that quarks and gluons are confined inside the nucleon, and we cannot uh, use uh, perturbative QCD to understand the behaviors of quarks and gluons inside the nucleon. So, uh, uh, in the last years, uh, non-perturbative non approaches like uh, Dyson Finger equation and lattice QCD are uh, having new and new results, but uh, to access and probe the proton, the experimental way remains uh, extremely accurate and useful. So, um, we would like to have a complete information about quarks and gluons inside the uh, nucleon. And so, this information is encoded by a set of uh, structure functions. So, for instance, uh, the, 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 the correlation between uh, longitudinal and transverse momentum of partons with their position inside the nucleon would be encapsulated in the Wigner distribution function. Um, if you integrate this distribution over uh, the transverse position of partons, what you get is the transverse momentum distributions that gives you correlation between longitudinal and transverse momentum of uh, partons inside the nucleon. And these distributions can be extracted, for instance, out of uh, semi-inclusive deep analytic scattering. But if you take the uh, Wigner distribution and in integrate them over the transverse momentum of the pattern, what you get is a generalized pattern distribution that gives you correlation between longitudinal momentum uh, of the partons and their transverse position inside the nucleon. The GPDs are accessible through what we call the deep exclusive processes, uh, which are processes where, in fact, we detect all the particles in the final state. Uh, it is uh, interesting also to mention that these GPDs are uh, quite uh, strongly constrained objects, since you must recover uh, from the GPDs the uh, parton distribution function and the form factor that you get from elastic scattering. So, uh, today's talk will be dedicated to what we call the golden channel to study the generalized pattern distribution, which is called deeply virtual quantum scattering. So here at Jefferson Lab, we have an lepton beam that will interact uh, with a quark inside a proton by exchanging a virtual photon Q. Um, this virtual photon will be absorbed, and then this quark will re-emit uh, a, a real photon um, before integrating the proton. So um, uh, I need to introduce a few uh, kinematical variables. So, for instance, we have the Q square, which will be the virtuality of the exchange virtual photon between the incoming lepton and the and the proton. Uh, the usual Birkin X uh, value. Uh, on this diagram here, what you can see is uh, the X uh, variable, which is the average longitudinal momentum fraction carried by the active quark. I said average because uh, there will be a longitudinal momentum transfer, uh, which is called psi here. Finally, uh, a last uh, kinematical variable is T, which is a squared momentum transfer to the nucleon. So if you take the diagram on the top left part of this slide, you can cut it into two parts. A part uh, where you have high momentum transfer, high energy transfer, and you can apply perturbative QCD, which is the part where you have your quark line that will absorb the real photon and then emit the real photon. And you have the bottom part that is basically the nucleon medium and that will be uh, described by the generalized pattern distribution. And as you can see, the generalized pattern distribution depends on the variable X, Psi, and T. So, uh, unlike the PDF that uh, can be accessed at first order quite easily from the uh, DIS cross-section here, the GPDs uh, parameterize the DVCS amplitude not directly but through a complex integral because uh, if you compute the amplitude associated to this diagram, what you have is uh, a convolution of the GPD with the upper part where you can apply the perturbative QCD. 
So here you can see the Compton form factor at the bottom of the slide, H++, which is the GPD times the propagator of the quark, and then you need to integrate over the X, uh, X variable, which is the average longitudinal momentum fraction carried by the active quark. So in the end, the DVCS amplitude is parameterized by complex integral uh, of GPDs that we call Compton form factors. 